Good morning, everybody. Uh, I got two Bibles today, so we're really going to get into it. Uh, how many of y'all, so coronavirus started March, end of March, middle of March, somewhere around there. How many of you thought we'd still be dealing with it the way we are now? Not many people. I remember uh, I was in Myrtle Beach with my family the weekend. It kind of started, we started closing stuff down. And uh, I remember that next Sunday I got the opportunity to preach, and I preached in 2 Corinthians, but I preached on chapter 1 and how Paul talks about that God comforts us and that we have to suffer for Him to comfort us. Um, a couple of weeks later on Facebook, I made a meme, I think that's what you call it. Uh, I'm not too familiar with those. Uh, I, I don't post a lot on Facebook, but uh, it was a picture of Dwight Schrute, and if any of y'all ever watched The Office, uh, you know who I'm talking about, but it was just a saying that said, how can the Holy, the great comforter, the Holy Spirit, come if we're always comfortable? Um, and... This week, just spending time with God and getting into the Word and talking with Him, uh, He reminded me of, of all of that, and uh, we're in 2 Corinthians again, uh, but this time in chapter 4. So just thinking about that, um, that is kind of what led me back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is probably one of my favorite books of the Bible, uh, just because of what Paul deals with in there and kind of reminding us. I don't know, when you think about Paul, you think almost when I first started, when you think about Paul's conversion and Paul, you, you almost think he's this heroic type person, almost like a Chuck Norris of the Bible, but he's really not. He's, uh, he's almost, uh, he deals with, uh, he even acknowledges that he's not a great speaker and that he's not the most courageous person but the cool thing about Paul is he notices that all his power and strength comes from the Holy Spirit and comes from Jesus and that all of his accomplishments are because of him and not because of anything he does but the world and and humans you know tend to make it about us right like what what look at what I did and and Paul is the opposite of that and I think that's why I cling toward Paul because you know I need to be reminded of that all the time. Uh, I just realized, you know, I didn't introduce myself. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of new, still new here, I guess. Uh, my name is Nick Adams, by the way. My daughter, Olivia, was the one sitting beside Bobby. I have two daughters, Olivia and Lainey. Lainey is two and Olivia is four. Uh, I'm not sure at what point I quit introducing myself. So when y'all start telling me, I'll stop. <laughs> uh, but... I want to pray before we get into it, all right? God, I just want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for this awesome privilege of being able to share your word and, and just what you've laid on my heart. I just pray that you'll get me out of the way and, and say whatever needs to be said today. And, and uh, I just pray that you prepare our hearts and minds and ears to hear you and see you. And uh, I just thank you for this awesome opportunity. I love you. Amen. Okay, so... Uh, when I think about, how many of you like darkness? How many of you like to be in the dark? One person. Bobby Norwood likes to be in the dark. I know some people that are so scared of the dark, they'll make you walk them to their truck at night when they leave your house. Uh, when I think of darkness, I, I also, uh, something, another part of me I do heating and air work uh, and it's what I did before uh, I become a full-time pastor I still do heating and air work I love to help people uh, in any way I can but uh, most time when I think about darkness I associate that with mold because most of the time in dark places there's mold or mildew and I get to deal with that on a weekly basis um, so it is true that mold can grow in light and darkness, but it's only light that exposes it, right? And 
The reason I'm talking about mold is because most of the time I associate mold with sin, almost. Uh, it's something that you try to cover up, but it still keeps growing. It's still there. Almost uh, like if you have mold in, in under your house, how often do you, does anybody crawl under their house? Nobody. I crawl under houses on an almost weekly basis. Uh, and so I get to see that a lot, and I get constantly reminded that uh, what we're fixing to read is Paul's going to be talking about light and darkness. And that there's this light source that exposes darkness and exposes sin and, and conquered it. And uh, I just want you to keep that in mind as we read. Uh, but so getting right into the scripture, I'm reading from New Living Translation. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, this is Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, and um, starting in verse 5, I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, but just keep in mind, you know, just some of the things I had just talked about. Um, verse 5 says, we don't go around preaching about ourselves, we preach Christ Jesus the Lord. All we say about ourselves is that we are servants because of what Jesus has done for us. For God, who said, let there be light in darkness, has made us understand that this light is the brightness of the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. See, the first thing I think Paul wants you to notice is that it's his light, it's not ours. And that... Paul even talks about that when there's light in the darkness, talking about, you know, Paul, doesn't, Paul acknowledges in verse 5 that, you know, in Corinth at the time, the reason Paul is writing another letter to church of Corinth is because there was these preachers going around kind of manipulating the word and manipulating... Uh, the text and, and, and using preaching or public speaking as a way to make money or as a way for their personal gain. And Paul is coming back and reminding the church that we don't go around preaching about ourselves. I'm here talking about Christ Jesus. All we say about ourselves is that we are servants. And what Paul is talking about here, I like to refer to in in Luke chapter 1, verses 7, 78 and 79, when, um, I can't remember the guy's name, Zechariah is talking about John the Baptist in verse 78. He, he says, because of God's tender mercy, the light from heaven is about to break upon us and to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death and to guide us to this path of peace. I did not mean for Bobby to take the pulpit. Uh, I haven't. I normally don't use it, but it's hard for me to flip back and forth and walk around and talk. I, I'm a uh, one-track kind of guy. I can't do two things at one time. Uh, so that's a little, a little better. Uh, what I was trying to say is what Paul is saying is in verse 6, when he's talking about light and darkness. He's talking about, you know, Jesus has made us understand that this light is the glory of God. And only the glory of God can expose the darkness. And Jesus came to do that and did that. He conquered death. Like Scott was just saying when he was singing those songs, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And it's only through him. Everyone can see that our glorious power is from God and is not our own. See, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is really Paul reflecting on what he says in chapter 3 in verse 18, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And and it says, And all of us have had the veil removed so that we can be mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of the Lord. And as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like Him and reflect His glory even more. See, 
That's what Paul's talking about when he's saying, let there be light in the darkness and that we are supposed to be a reflection of that. The reason I'm telling you this is uh, I got a group of guys that meet with me on Friday morning. Uh, we used to eat breakfast together before the virus and because of everything being closed, we've been doing like a conference call type thing. Uh, we've been meeting since November, every Friday. Uh, we're a pretty tight group now. But one of the guys was sharing about some of the troubles he was having, and it just you know confirmed to me that God was speaking Second Corinthians 4 over me to share with y'all today. But the reason I said that was one of the guys has a rental house in Georgia, and um, he had went to go check on it because the guy was supposed to be moving out. When he went, um, there was holes all in the wall, flooring was destroyed, some of the windows were broken out, One of the front door wasn't even shut because it was warped, and the door jam was busted, and the house was just a complete mess. I mean... Thousands of dollars to fix. Uh, and it won't just like a you know, normal wear and tear on a house and living in it. And, you know, you would think, what would be your first reaction walking into that? Amen. <laughs> but what surprised me was he said, y'all need to pray for that guy. And he, he named the guy's name, but you need to pray for that guy. Uh, we're going to try to help them. But, because there's, there's no point in acting like the world would act. And, and that's what Paul's leading up to and, and fixing to get into because what does Jesus remind us in, in the Gospels that we're going to have trouble, right? We're dealing with trouble now. How many of you are, are tired of sitting at home? <laughs> How many of you are, you know, tired of wondering if who's telling you the truth and not telling you the truth and, and what you don't know what to believe, so to speak, as far as the media and politics and all that junk? We're going to have troubles. But Paul points out in verse 8 that, which is my second point, that, you know, death brings life. Suffering is a means in through which God can minister through you. And the word ministry just means service. And everybody has a ministry. Verse 8 says, We are pressed on every side by troubles. We are not crushed and broken. We are perplexed, but we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and keep going. Those suffering... Through suffering, these bodies of ours constantly share in the death of Jesus, so the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will, obvious, will be obvious in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but it has resulted in eternal life for you. So when you go, the world wants to see how you're going to react when you go through troubles. And that's what Paul's talking about. I think about, you know, when he says in verse 7, but this precious treasure, this light and power that now shine within us is held in perishable containers, meaning our bodies, so everyone can see that our glorious power is from God, not, not our own, Almost everything with Jesus is upside down or inside out. I titled the message "Non-Perishables." When you th when I think about non-perishables, I think about canned food for some reason because it's a non-perishable item, so to speak. It's what people label them as. But I think about this is I don't I don't know if you're going to get this, but I think about a can of green beans, and with Jesus. He puts the green beans on the outside, the thing that's perishing, so you can see the thing that's not going to perish. 
So, but that all depends on how you react to things, how you react to trouble, how you react to situations. People can't see the light when you're focused on your physical body all the time or when you're focused on things of the world because we are going to face troubles. And Paul, if any of y'all know anything about Paul, he faced a lot of troubles, a lot more than I think we as Christians in America face today. Uh, We don't get stoned or beat or persecuted or threatened with death. We have the comfort of sitting in an air-conditioned building and cushion chairs talking about God. I think sometimes we forget how spoiled we are. But there's going to come times when you have opportunities to show your light, His light, not yours. And there's benefits from that. Scott, when he was talking about one of the songs they sang, he was talking about, you know, you got to start with the foundation of Jesus. And when you start with that, all that other stuff don't matter. All that other, when you have the foundation of Jesus, when you got that foundation, it doesn't matter what, what happens. It doesn't matter how many coronaviruses there are or how many. There's always going to be some kind of coronavirus. There's always going to be the next thing. So are you going to let that determine who you are and what you do? Or is your foundation in Jesus who is the light? There's benefits. Verse 13 says, But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believe in God, so I speak. I know that the same God who raised our Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself along with you. All of these things are for your benefit. And as God's grace brings more and more people to Christ, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. What Paul is saying is that when we continue to talk about God and when we use, as Bobby was just saying, when we use those opportunities to talk about what we like to turn the conversation back toward Christ, more and it's for others' benefit. What are we here for? Last time I preached, I talked about we're made for people, we're here for people, right? God was about people. What is the church? The body of Christ is y'all, us. God's grace brings more and more people to Christ. So you doing what you're supposed to do as a Christian is for other people's benefit and for your own benefit because what's going to happen? One day there's going to be a great big party. And the more people there, the bigger the party's going to be and the better it's going to be. That's what he's talking about when he says there'll be a great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. That's what we're here for. That's what the light inside of us is. That's, that's why we have these perishable containers, so to speak. Some translations say jars of clay. On Wednesday nights, we have a prayer meeting service, so to speak, and... Um, you know, every week I get almost burdened by the amount of requests that comes in and all the, to be able to see and hear all the people that are suffering and have all these ailments and situations and cancer and coronavirus and all these things. And Second Corinthians 4 reminds me that that's going to happen. Everybody is going to go through some kind of suffering. Everybody's going to have an ailment. But is it better to pat people on the back and tell them you're praying for them and that you're praying that that ailment goes away or is it better to get help people understand that that ailment is for their benefit and somebody else's benefit and to be more focused on your spiritual life than your physical life? Francis Chan gives an illustration. I don't know if y'all have seen it. It's probably on YouTube, but he's got a rope 
and it goes off the stage and he's, he pulls on it for a little bit to make it seem like it's never ending. And then on the end of that rope, there's just little red tassel. And he explains that that tassel is like your life here on earth. And you're so focused about this three-inch piece of the rope that you forget that you have the rest of your life, eternity, if you're a Christian. And that's what Paul's through this chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians is trying to remind people that, yeah, we constantly have suffering, we constantly share in, in, in suffering, but... We, when we get that opportunity, it is a blessing because we get to experience just a little bit of what Jesus went through. And others get to see that Jesus in our lives, but only if we're close to Him and we're walking with Him and we, we understand that concept of that there's a light inside of us and that our bodies are meant to get older and weaker and to decay and that when they start to do that, it only lets the light shine brighter. Verse 16 says, that is why we never give up. Because of what Jesus did. Jesus tells a parable in Luke 18. And in that parable, let me find it right quick. He tells a parable of a persistent widow. But in that parable, you know, the whole summary or gist of the parable is that there was a certain judge in a city and uh, he didn't believe in God and, and this woman kept aggravating about her situation or her case and kept appealing for justice. And she kept on and on and on. And the judge finally said, but this woman, this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice. And then Jesus said, learn a lesson from this evil judge. Even when he rendered a just decision in the end, so don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who plead with him day and night? We will keep put, will, we keep, will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when I the Son of Man return, how many will I find who have faith? Verse 16, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever uh it's not a coincidence that the uh, miss trudy who's the children's ministry director she does um a memory verse every month with the kids and does it in sign language because you know the more senses you can evoke the the higher chance they'll have to remember i have Short-term memory loss. I, I can't remember anything. I think that's, I quit. You know, I normally just preach with my Bible. And all this people, piece of paper is just Bible verses. I don't have any notes because I used to try to prepare a message and I'm going to say it different every time. I'm going to forget what... I just want God to show up. And, and the more I do it, the more I trust that he is going to show up and the, the more comfortable I get with him showing up. But anyway, she does these sign language verses. And, and the verse of the month, this month is Ephesians 3.20. Now he is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. And guess what the sign is for immeasurably? M- measuring it and then more. More than that. So whatever you can think of, and more than that. He is, yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. 
Verse 18 says, so don't look at the troubles we can now see. Rather, we look forward to what we have not seen, for the troubles we will see will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. I like how uh, I read the New Living Translation most of the time because it says it a little more plainly and it's a little easier for me to understand. But I love how the New the NIV says, says those last two verses. Listen. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. you got to have a forever filter. And when you put that forever filter on in your mind, it changes the way you look at life. And it changes the way other people see you. The people see the light in you. Or every time you have an ailment, or every time something happens, do you give up? Do you complain about it? I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not up here trying to condemn any of y'all. I, have, I struggle with the same things. But Second Corinthians chapter 4 just reminds me, you need to change your filters. If y'all notice, I relate a lot of things back to heating and air. If you don't change your air filter at home, eventually it'll get clogged up and your air conditioner will quit working. Same thing with your mind. If you're not being renewed day by day by walking in the Spirit with Jesus, eventually it's going to get clogged up with all the junk the world throws at you, and you're not going to have that eternal perspective. Inside out. Green beans on the outside. When you go to the store, hopefully there will be some green beans there. I remember when coronavirus first started, you know, they won't know non all non-perishable items were about gone. But I like to use that illustration because every time I go to the grocery store and I see a can of green beans, it reminds me of 2 Corinthians 4. It reminds me that what is on the inside is supposed to be on the outside. And that your physical bodies are supposed to perish so people can see Jesus. But that's only if you're thinking about kingdom things, eternal things. What the spirit or inner man sees surpasses what the physical eyes see. I read this Bible I found. Um, I had an NIV study Bible that I got, I don't know, in 7th or 8th grade. And... Uh, I gave it away to somebody when I first started teaching Sunday high school Sunday school when we first came here, and uh, I got a New Living Translation study Bible. But I grew up on NIV. I'd found this Bible in a tote that, of my dad's stuff, uh, and I'd opened it the other day, and uh, I realized that this Bible was gave to him when he was baptized on August 21st, 1988 at Rosewood Baptist Church. Uh, so it's, it's pretty special to me. The reason I told you that is because thinking about the Wednesday prayer list and, and changing your perspective on the way you pray and being on an eternal mindset or perspective. I, my dad was an alcoholic. Um, and we didn't have the best relationship in the world because I didn't see him a whole lot. Um, but I prayed, I hinged my relationship based on a prayer that I prayed to God for almost 10 years every single night. That me and my dad would have a better relationship and that that was the main part of the prayer but 
when I was 19, um, I got a phone call that from my Mima because I, you know, I didn't, I hadn't talked to my dad in about three months. He was traveling uh, the country. He was usually only home about a weekend or two a month uh, with his job, and I hadn't talked to him in about three months. I was in community college at the time. I got a phone call from my Mima and she said, "Your dad's in the hospital." And I said, "You know, well, okay, so what?" Uh, I hadn't talked to him, and um, my, if you know anything about my dad's side of the family, we don't communicate very well, and that was kind of all she said. Well, then she had to call my mom and explain to her what had went on until I finally got my attention that uh, my mom come and told me that he was pretty sick, you know, he was in, he was in the hospital and probably needed to go see him. Make a long story short, I went to go see him, and three days later, he died. He had cirrhosis of the liver. I didn't know it. Uh, I only got to spend three days with him. And I had thought, God did not answer my prayer. And I prayed that prayer more than any other prayer I've ever prayed. And so immediately I was asking why. Because at that same time, I too was alcohol. And I was not walking with God. I was not being renewed day by day. So my relationship with God almost hinged on that prayer. If you answer this prayer for me, I'll believe you more and start walking with you more. But I realized later when I surrendered and I died to myself and I said, I want what all you have, God, I realized that God did answer that prayer for me. My dad was baptized on August 21st, 1988 and saved. And he could not handle the troubles of this world and used alcohol to cover up all those troubles. And God kept trying to remind him of who he was. And God finally said, well, I'm just going to call you home because obviously you can't handle the world here. So now he's home and I don't have to worry about where he's at, what he's doing. And I know that I get to spend eternity with my dad. Both of them, my heavenly father and my earthly father. But it was only when my mindset changed to an eternal perspective and not a worldly perspective. That's what I want you to see. That no, I'm not saying, I'm not at all saying God can't do miracles. But don't make your relationship God based off a miracle. A miracle is just a sign that points you to Him. Do you have that forever filter? Because when you start, as Bobby talks about, been talking about all year. You know, we're going toward a new day. I believe somewhere in here it even says, we look forward to what is not seen. We're on a journey with God. We're going toward a new day. Well, you can only have that filter if you're walking with Him, if you're on that journey with Him. And people are, can only see that light and that power in you if you're with them all the time. Are you with them, as Bobby said last service, are you with them Sunday, well, for us, Monday through Saturday? Because all this is right here is just a celebration. That's you know we come in here and woo. <laughs> I don't do that well. <laughs> I don't have the voice for it. Uh, this is just a celebration of, of of what we got to do this week and walking with them. But where you let your light shine is really Monday through Saturday. His light. You need to quit saying yours. It's his, <laughs> and it's inside of you 
if you believe, if you're a Christian. I'm going to pray. God, I just want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for, uh, for this time we got to spend with you. I want to thank you for Paul, for uh, being able to acknowledge that it didn't have anything to do with him and had everything to do with you. I pray that we can just, as believers, for believers, just continue to die to ourselves and be renewed every day with your Spirit and Jesus Christ and, and let our sufferings and our troubles be opportunities to, for your light to shine. Help us not to react to everything that goes on in the world, but respond to what we know to be true in you. If there's anybody in this room or listening online that's not a Christian, it it, it all starts with Jesus. If there's anybody that that doesn't doesn't know what I'm talking about, they got to know that they can come as they are as Scott and the Morning Glory band's about to sing, that that you can come as you are, and and only thing you got to do is come and just ask Him. I just pray that if there's anybody that you're dealing with right now, God, that that is feeling that way, that they would just take that step. And uh, I just thank you for constantly reminding us. Of, of what you do and who you are. Uh, as Isaiah 55 1 says, those who are thirsty come and drink. I just pray that whatever whatever's about to happen, dear Lord, that, that it'll just be for your glory and and that um, we're just going to give people time to respond right now. I love you. Ask for it in your name. Amen.